yes, I, I must confess that I'm not an expert on microfinance. I usually work on industrial policy, trade strategy, and that kind of thing. What got me into this, and then I, I go into the, this uh, background because I think uh, it's a kind of nice way of uh, situating the uh, issue and, and by extension the paper in the broader context. But for some years I've been nagged by this uh, feeling that what we used to call development when I was a student in the 1980s doesn't seem to be on the radar screen anymore. <laughs> but, uh, in the 60s, 70s, at, uh, at least at, at the earlier part of uh, the 80s, there was actually a consensus right across the spectrum from one Rosto on the right to the dependency theories on the left that development is not almost entirely, but uh, mainly about transforming the productive structure. And somehow, this uh, production side of the story has disappeared and now when people talk about development, they basically mean poverty reduction. And recently, microfinance has become the, uh, uh, the, the key element in this uh, poverty reduction strategy. And I mean, frankly, it looks like a no-brainer. You know? I mean, entrepreneurship is what drives capitalism, as uh, Schumpeter said. You go to developing countries, uh, it's uh, teeming with entrepreneurial energy. I mean, people are selling everything and anything uh, you can think of and things that you didn't know you could buy. I mean, for the, in many developing countries, you, could, you can actually buy a place in the queue for the visa section of the American embassy, and sold to you by professional queuers. Yeah? You can buy the, the a patch of ground to beg from, yeah? sold to you by yeah. the local dogs. Yeah? So, I mean, the, the whole place is uh, that teamed with the, the, this stuff, and also, actually, when you look at the number, for example, the, 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 the Americans might think that uh, Bangladesh is poor because uh, they are not enterprising enough, but actually, if you look at the statistics, only about 7.5% of Americans are self-employed, yeah? i.e., engaged in some kind of enterprise. Yeah? In contrast, 75% of uh, the Bangladeshis are entrepreneurs of one kind or another. Yeah? So in this kind of uh, environment, yes, uh, that they certainly lack finance, give them money, yeah, let them uh, pull themselves out of uh, poverty, and I mean, that part is not usually clearly explained, but uh, somehow this will add up to economic development. Yeah? But, you know, when you look at the reality, why are countries like Bangladesh not developing? So the, I got to really doubt the, 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 the developmental power of uh, microfinance. And then I, that, I got to talk to Milford, who's uh, the real expert on microfinance. I mean, the, the, as you can see from the book, when you read it, and he's uh, convinced me that microfinance <coughs> isn't even good for poverty reduction. Yeah? So it's uh, quite a depressing picture. I mean, I really don't want to kind of the, 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 the be so kind of uh, negative and yeah, spoiling the party when yeah, everyone is uh, in this game. But uh, the, I think uh, the, there's something deeply troubling about this, and I mean that. Our arguments are laid out uh, in the presentation that uh, Milford is going to give uh, in a minute. But that, uh, if I may, to finish off, uh, to emphasize a more conceptual issue here. I mean, I, I think what has made microfinance more popular than it deserves to be is this mistaken notion of entrepreneurship and productivity. Uh, we see it all as individual thing. Yeah? So you want to yeah, make, your, uh, that, that, that make money, you want to yeah, improve your situation, you go out and get a loan, you buy a store to sell that, that noodles from, yeah? 
is it really the way that the, the how it works? Because in the end, I believe that the, our productivity as an individual is collectively determined. You, know, you might be a I don't know very skilled the, the, the machinist working in a high tech uh, Swiss factory, yeah, earning seventy thousand dollars a year. They drop you in the middle of Bangladesh. Yeah? What are you going to do? Yeah? I mean, you cannot even the, the, probably become a car mechanic because uh, you never fix uh, the car yourself. Yeah? You know, what appears to be individual skill is actually buoyed by a whole raft of yeah? social institutions, organizations, yeah? invisible the knowledge, and so on. And uh, I think that the this way of uh, looking at uh, this uh, microfinance issue probably has, through this route, a broader implication for uh, the, our understanding of uh, economic development. Okay, without further ado, let me ask uh, Milford to, yeah. Okay, so um, some of you will be aware of the issues in terms of microfinance, so it has become a very big development policy over the last 20 years, and, um, but there are many, many, as Hajun was, was, was alluding to, there are many fundamental problems. And jumping to the conclusion, part of the problem is that economically it doesn't add up, but politically there's a very good case to be made for microfinance by particular business and political elites. So that's where the support for microfinance comes from, but the economic argument really doesn't add up. That's, so basically, I mean, for some of you, this will be this will be this will, this is quite fairly well known. It all goes back to Dr. Mohammed Yunus in the 1970s doing action research on um, giving out small loans to to women. He then forms the Grameen Bank. He convinces the international development community that this is going to lead to poverty reduction and so-called bottom-up development. So without the international donor community's support, this thing would have been, uh, in, in a sense, killed at birth. It, it relied on the international donor community. Now, this is his famous phrase, poverty will be eradicated in a generation, and we'll have to go to a poverty museum uh, to see what all the fuss was about. <laughs> so the international donors love the issue of non-state development, the idea of self-help, this was slightly before the Reagan-Thatcher revolution, but it was in the minds of the World Bank and USAID that they needed to tell the poor to look after themselves, don't rely on anybody else. So self-help was really something that they were very keen. And here along comes Grameen Bank saying we can give self, uh, everybody the option to get themselves out of poverty. It was, it was manna from heaven. Also, the supposedly high repayment rates on these micro loans that Grameen Bank was giving out, something like 98%, meant that the, the poor were bankable. The, unlike the state banks, which were getting 60 to 70% repayment rates, Grameen Bank, working with the poor, was getting 98%. Wasn't quite true, but anyway, it was good. Uh, it was good. Yeah. Okay, so that was the initial founding of the Grameen Bank. It was subsidized by the international donor community, by country governments in Bangladesh and then in Bolivia. Um, but then along the neoliberal revolution then comes along and so the Washington institutions take a, a little bit more of a harder look at microfinance. And um, one of the issues in the donor community in the 1980s was this thing called full cost recovery. So whatever program donors are, are working on, the users must pay the full cost, whether it's healthcare, whether it's education. Microfinance wasn't going to be an exception. So the idea of full cost recovery was brought into microfinance. And so the original Grameen Bank model, which was dependent upon government or donor subsidies, was slowly edged out and a new, more hard-nosed, commercialised model came in. And I've termed it the new wave model. And that basically shifted the Grameen Bank model, was consigned to history. Um, and this new commercialised model came in. Yunus, Professor Yunus was allowed to stay on, if you like, the friendly face of microfinance, but the original Grameen Bank model was basically dead. There was this new thing called commercialised microfinance, and the, bank, the Grameen Bank actually changed over to commercialised microfinance in around 2002 to, to, be in, to, to, to not lose relevance, if you like. Um, okay, so it becomes, by the 1990s, it becomes the single most important anti-poverty policy. 
All the major donor industries, uh, donor in uh, organisations are working in this area. And um, very soon also the World Bank be began to commission um, uh, evaluations. What is the poverty impact? And of course, undertaken by World Bank economists, well, not surprisingly, they come up with very positive evaluations. Um, it's part of your contract if you work for the World Bank, I'm sure. Um, later on, it turned out that independent evaluations were actually saying, well, hang on a second, we can't actually find any genuine poverty impact here. And that came out about last year, so there's a, there's a huge ruction going on in, in the microfinance industry. But anyway, in the 1990s, everybody falls in love with microfinance, and it becomes almost the people's anti-poverty policy, if you like. Um, everybody can see something good in microfinance. It, everybody loves it, the Middle Eastern royalty, once Queen Rania comes on the screens to talk about microfinance, how can you not support microfinance? So um, it becomes very popular and it becomes the accepted donor policy. Now, by the 2000s, some real problems start to emerge. First of all, they can't find any evidence that it works. So they're doing all sorts of impact evaluations using case study methodology, econometric methodology, client versus non-client methodology, and they can't actually find any evidence that it's actually having an impact on poverty. Um, another awkward fact, and this is something that Harjun has pointed out in, in, in various places, it's rather awkward that Bangladesh, where the financial system is very much now focused upon microfinance, is getting left behind by everybody else, like its near neighbours, that have looked at the Bangladesh model and said, well, that's not for us, we want something with a bit more beef, and they've moved into a much more proactive policy-based lending model, and they're scooting ahead. And the latest example, which is very interesting, is Vietnam. They actually went to Grameen and had a look at it and said, well, that doesn't work for us, we're going to do a much more policy-based lending looking at small businesses with some growth potential. Fantastic success, fantastic success. So the other awkward fact is that those countries that have got a lot of microfinance, saturated in other words, there's a real problem because none of them seem to be growing. In fact, they all seem to be having quite severe problems, as I'll explain in a minute. So um, that's part of the, the problem. We're running into all these problems. The very latest problem was a bank in Mexico called Compartamos, which was a very aggressive hard-nosed microfinance bank founded by the donors with donor money but taken over by its employees and they started to mint money for themselves, paying themselves massive salaries and then they took it all the way to an IPO in 2007 and several of the people earned 20 to 25 million dollars each in an institution which was an NGO capitalized by the donors designed to promote poverty reduction upon the, the, uh, among the poverty, uh, the poor in Mexico. So the whole... And charging 100% interest. interest rates. Um, uh, so there's clearly some problems starting to emerge. I mean, a Campartamos, I wrote about it in the book, thinking that was the worst that it could ever be. We've seen another one in India where they, the guys in charge, about seven guys, they're going to make something like $200 million dollars from an institution capitalized by the donors, and they were just employees, but somehow they could see a way to get in, very much like on Wall Street. It's quite a, a disaster. So we don't, one of the interesting factors then in 2009 is that we start to see some independent evaluations. There's a couple of people at Yale University, for example, Dean Carlin, another one, Esther Duflo. They're doing some independent evaluations using something called randomized control trials. And they are embarrassingly coming out and saying, well, actually, you know, we can't actually find any impact. And so this is becoming a real problem for the microfinance industry because they've had billions of dollars and nobody can actually find that it's working. So what they've done is they've said, right, well, we don't believe we're not going to take any independent evaluations anymore. We are going to go back to the old methodology of individual case studies that we select. So you select some poor uh, person who opens a small store, makes a little bit of money, educates their kids, and that is going to be the uh, evidence base upon which the microfinance ball keeps rolling. So it's, it's bizarre at the moment. Um, and there's a couple of other issues which I'll touch upon later. I mean, job displacement and client failure left out of the reckoning when it comes to, to microfinance. Job displacement, I mean, if you set up a small hairdresser with microfinance 
um, and it creates two jobs. Now, in poor communities, you generally have a lot of hairdressers anyway. So all you tend to do is you put out of business the next door one with two people. So there's no net employment gain. Now, in all the evaluations, they refuse to take that into account because they use the randomised control is based on medical trials, whereas if I take a drug for cancer, against cancer and you take it and you have a placebo, the fact that I am going to be cured has got nothing to do with you and the same with you, or what, what happens to me. <coughs> whereas if I open a hairdresser in a small street in Medellin in Colombia, I put out of business the one next door, quite obviously. So there's issues to do with that. The other big problem is client failure because we know that something like 98% of micro enterprises fail after five years. We don't, we don't trace to find out, I mean, do these people fall into deeper poverty, which most research is now starting to say is actually the case. A friend of mine calls it a 10th floor evaluation when they're, when they're looking at microfinance. You look at the second, you look at the first couple of years, it's a bit like a guy who says, well, I can jump off a 20 story building and I can survive, so let's not, work, let's not build a fire escape. Sorry, fire escapes, after what you, you had the other day. Uh, let's not build a fire escape. And so the evaluations guys come in and they say, well, yeah, it's actually best. The guy can survive the 20 floors, uh, John. How do you know? Well, we had an evaluation at the 10th floor. We interviewed him as he was, and what did he say? Well, so far, so good. So they said, so it must work, so we don't need to build a fire escape. And that's what they call them, 10th floor evaluations. Just a couple of years into an evaluation. Okay. So... Getting on to the meat, what, why doesn't microfinance work? Well, this is starting with the original Grameen Bank model before we come on to the commercialised. Issues of, and I'll just have to skirt over these, but you can, you can get the slideshow from Antonio. Issues of minimum efficient scale. Most of the businesses, by definition, are tiny. Tiny means no chance of success. Start, starting off with, with small, the tiniest postage stamp subsistence farms, small units. And it's investing community money in inter enterprises which are not going to work. Now that has an opportunity cost to it, because if you're taking people's savings and remittances and investing them in businesses which 98% collapse after five years, you're not investing in the businesses that we know are going to be productive and that have a greater chance of success, but they're slightly more risky. So there's a big opportunity cost there. Big issue, you can see this in India, where microfinance has very heavily got into subsistence farms, the tiniest and least productive farms, and the farmers can't pay the 40% interest rates. So they're trapped working with microfinance and not, not really being productive. On the other hand, you've got family farms, which most environmental economists now say are the most productive, but they don't get anything because they can't support 40% interest rates. They would like... 10%, maybe a bit of a grace period, maybe over five years or whatever, to fit in with the agricultural cycle. Well, tough. You either take 40% microfinance or you don't get anything. So clearly the, there's a problem there. There's a pro very similar problem in Mexico with that sort of um, uh, problem of... Uh, and it all comes down to what Thomas Dichter has called the paradox that the poorest people can't really do... Uh, very much with, with the microfinance at 40% interest rates, repay, repayable in one year, whatever. Um, and the people who are slightly up, the small businesses with a bit of technology and innovation and some scale economies, they don't actually get the money. So there's a real problem there. Uh, another problem uh, is this issue, and I've touched upon it, is this issue of fallacy of composition. That if you introduce a new hairdresser in the street, you can, well, by, by definition, if they, they do okay, you can, everybody can become a hairdresser. Well, of course, it doesn't work like that because a community can only support so many of the certain types of businesses, the simple products and services. So there's a fallacy of comp composition there. You're assuming that because one business creates one extra job, that that means you must be creating a net employment at the community level, which doesn't actually hold at all. And the work I've done in Croatia with a colleague is that, um, uh, for example, in the milk uh, industry, which we looked at, the dairy industry, um, all these tiny one-cow farms coming in actually has an effect on the, the price effect, so the non-clients are not too happy by having a lower raw milk price. Um, and also because all the demand is actually shared out by lots of farms, I mean, obviously your costs go up when your turnover goes down. Your costs go up so your margins go down, your profits and your wages go down. So really it's, it's not, uh, you have to take that into account, particularly in poor communities where most of the goods and services that the poor demand have been provided for, for many, many years. It's not something that you can add to very easily. It's a big one that we've looked at because I think Hajun and my, I myself, I also came into microfinance from a, working on a doctorate on, on industrial policy in the former Yugoslavia. 
and looking at microfinance and realising, well, this is taking the, the economy in completely the wrong direction. As a, it should be more about technology and innovation and building up scale and, and networks. And actually, microfinance is steering them in completely the opposite direction. So that's where I came into microfinance. So in a sense, it's a programmed deindustrialization um, uh, policy, if you like. It's taking community savings and dumping them in those types of businesses that have got no growth potential whatsoever, particularly in places like Africa. I did a, 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 a conference last week and debating this issue, and that is one of the big issues in Africa, that there's lots of money swashing around Africa, donor money, remittance income, but almost all of it goes into the tiniest uh, non-industrial enterprises and subsistence farms, and you've got people there with great ideas. They just want $20,000. They want a little bit of machinery, maybe a little bit of this or that and the other. They don't get anything. They don't get anything. And it's the people who can do hardly anything with it that are just overburdened with five, six, seven microloans. So it's a real problem at the moment. Agriculture, once microfinance gets into agriculture, you start to have some serious problems because, as I said, the farmers can't actually deal with these tiny, tiny loans and they end up in a poverty trap, as we've uh, clearly seen recently in Andhra Pradesh in India. It's a very serious situation. Productivity is collapsing there, yet there's more money than they've ever had before. The problem is that where the money goes, it's not the su supply of money, it's the actual direction of the money, which I think is what we're really trying to get at. Another issue that I think maybe some people touched upon earlier, this issue of, of connectability. Now, we know from going back to Alfred Marshall, the, the idea of businesses agglomerating together is very good for the local economy. Um, right up to Michael Porter and then uh, Pure and Sable with the second industrial divide, enterprises that link together create a much more efficient system. But you've got to have the raw material, you've got to have the enterprises that link together. Microfinance produces exactly the opposite type of enterprise, the tiniest micro-enterprise, which basically doesn't cooperate with anybody, because it doesn't have the skill, it doesn't have the scale, it doesn't have the technology. So you're creating lots of atomized little enterprises. None of them can actually agglomerate together because they don't have the, they don't have the strength to do it. Um, so that's a, a real big problem with that. Uh, microfinance, you see this everywhere. It's basically attached to the informal sector. And there are real problems about extending the informal sector um, ad infinitum. So unless you start to formalise activity, not in the De Soto and sort of idea of, 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 of informalising the formal, but I mean formalising, paying taxes, ad adhering to certain regulations. Microfinance is taking the economy in completely the other direction, using bigger and bigger sums of money to do it. Um, and the final one, solidarity and social capital. So we've seen this in many countries where um, uh, people working in groups and there's a lot of pressure to repay the loans, um, a lot of pressure from, there's a, there's a gender aspect because husbands are pressurising the wives to do it. Um, there's all sorts of issues about social capital being destroyed as, this, this, as the number one um, uh, uh, objective is about repaying a loan. Okay? It's not about community development so much as just repay that bloody loan. Um, and so that's, that's a real problem. I mean, I'm skirting through these, but they're, but they're all there. So that was the situation with the sort of Grameen Bank basic microfinance. As we move into the 1990s, we have the commercialising World Bank type USAID ideas coming in. And that even uh, makes the problem uh, worse. So financial sustainability at all costs. There's no evidence of this famous double bottom line where we're looking after the profits but also looking after the customers. That seems to have gone out of the window. As we say, interest rates now, uh, they, they're basically being charged at, at the, uh, to what the market can bear, uh, rather than what will benefit our clients and trying to keep interest rates low. Now, one of the costs, one of the justifications for high costs, uh, for, for high interest rates is because our costs are high. But when people have started to look into it, particularly in Compartamos and then in, in Cambodia and other places, they actually find one of the reasons why costs are so high is because of this thing called labour costs, but not general labour costs, management remuneration. Mm. So in Mexico, you, the average, I don't know what the average income is, is, is a year, but I don't think it's very much. Uh, but when... Nine, eight, nine thousand dollars. Okay, so, that's, so when the managers are paying themselves a quarter of a million dollars... Mm. All of the top 20 managers, and then plus you added in dividends, well, actually, you know, that's, what's that got to do with poverty reduction? I mean, they're, they're actually, um, in a sense, taking up some of the money from, from the bottom and using it from themselves. So, it, it, you know, that's a business strategy. That's not a poverty reduction strategy. Um, 
So then we get onto this idea of this thing called social businesses that Professor Yunus is now moving on to. Um, uh, whether that's actually the social businesses I've looked at, for example, Grameen Telecom, I mean, these are businesses that are designed to benefit the multinational corporation agenda far more than it's about, develop, uh, about uh, uh, satisfying a poverty reduction agenda. Just because there is some small benefit at the poverty reduction side, but a huge benefit on the multinational agenda, then you know, we've got to be careful about what's actually at stake here and not get sucked into something that actually isn't. It's more about hype and PR than anything else. So I've mentioned this about uh, SKS in India. I did some interviews on, on Indian uh, TV the other day about these. I mean, the guy's just made 12 million for 25% of his share options. These guys have been catapulted into a, India's list of top 100 millionaires in the space of six months. I mean, great work if you can get it. I mean, but, for, but it's not really to do with anything to do with poverty reduction anymore. So my conclusion, I've, I'm, as I say, I've rushed through that. So what I think, what it, what it looks like at the end of the day is we're getting a misallocation of resources. So microfinance institutions are mobilizing lots and lots of savings of the poor, not just of the middle class or the upper, the elite, but of the poor are very good at saving. So they're mobilizing all this cash. And on the benefit of society, they're investing it all back into the tiniest and least sustainable businesses. Now, whether that's a good thing for society, um, uh, you know, we certainly don't think it is. I mean, that isn't how societies grow. It doesn't create the seeds of tomorrow's type of, of development. So what, we, what you could say is it actually institutionalizes poverty and underdeveloped, ra underdeveloped rather than resolves it. Okay? And then, the, then along came the neoliberal, the Washington Consensus in the 1990s to add the commercialization spin to microfinance. And it really is all about financial self-sustainability and profitability and employee capture, very much a Wall Street style escapade. Um, and it's not really about development uh, any, anymore. So that goes on to the final point. Well, if all, having said all that about microfinance not really being about economic development, what accounts for why it's still, the ball's still rolling? Well, that's where the, politi the political issue comes in. Um, and that's because uh, throughout the 60s and 70s and 80s, I mean, business elites in the World Bank were, were worried about the idea of the poor and their numbers and their mobilization and the fact that they were going to move together to vote in pro-poor governments and through social movements and trade unions. And the business and political elites were worried about that. There's no secret about that. Robert McNamara at the World Bank was worried and said, if poverty keeps going, these guys are going to vote in the communists or something like that. So there was an idea that we have to somehow be seen to be dealing with poverty, but in an individualized way, so that we individualize the response to poverty so that we don't feel threatened by the poor coming together and electing, for example, in Venezuela, a pro-poor government, which, of course, shots the pants of the Western political elite because it's the poor getting together and saying, we think the best way out of this is to elect a government that represents us. So that's a really threatening um, idea. So microfinance is perfect because it puts the responsibility back onto the poor and the way out of poverty is individually through your own little micro business and forget about trade unions, forget about wealth redistribution, forget about social movements or pro-poor governments. You just look upon your little enterprise and then business and political elites can sit back and say, thank goodness we've solved it. Okay, you, you guys just go off and do all that and just leave it to us. Okay, I'm oversimplifying, of course, but that is, there is something to that uh, particular argument. So it's a return to 19th century self-reliance. Getting the poor not to ask for too much, but to basically just work it out yourself, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, and just, just leave us to, uh, you know. There's also an international, if you like, imperialist dimension, because some of the richer countries don't want pro-poor governments getting in charge, and particularly pro-poor governments that might take over the national resources, like in Venezuela or, or Bolivia. That is definitely something they don't like. So it's much better that they focus on microfinance, microenterprises, and leave the other things um, just a very final thought on Jobra Village, because one of the issues is that, well, you know, all this microenterprise finance is going, to do, is going to do fantastic and it's going to pull these communities out of poverty. Well, one of the things is, well, why don't we go back to the first community where Mohammed Yunus was actually putting this action research project together and then where he set the Grameen Bank up. It's a town called Jobra. And in 2006, when he got the Nobel Peace Prize, they went back to Jobra to find out what was going on. 
Well, it's basically in even worse poverty than it was then. And there's one major structural change. All the inhabitants are basically in debt. The only people who got out of poverty were the people who found a job in the Gulf states. So, I mean, okay, you can't make policy or make, destroy a theory on the basis of one example, but I don't think it's, it's for the critics to, to explain what happened there. I think they should say, well, why didn't it work in Jobra? I mean, if it was going to work anywhere, it was going to work in Jobra because of the... But there are other villages like Jobra everywhere. And in Jobra now, you can't film... Uh, I know this, there's something going on at the moment. You can't film in Jobra because the guys from Grameen come out and tell you who you can talk to and what you can do. And it's because they're aware of this idea that microfinance is the solution. And yet in the one village where it's got more microfinance than it knows what to do with, there's been no development. So I think that's, that's an issue that needs explaining, perhaps not by, by me, but may, perhaps by Professor Eunice, I don't know. Um, okay, that's, that's it then.